This is the program on constitutional government, and our guest today is Carol Hooven. Carol Hooven is the author of a new book called T, The Story of Testosterone. She's a lecturer in, at Harvard in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology, and she also serves as director of undergraduate studies. And <clears throat> this is uh, connected with the fact, perhaps, that she teaches a very popular uh, undergraduate course at Harvard. And she's written a fine book on testosterone, which is a hormone that men have a lot more of than women. And that seems to produce aggressive behavior. So ag aggression as, uh, as a difference between men and women, that's uh, taken up in this book, perhaps especially in chapter seven, uh, whose title is uh, Violent Men. This book is praised as an example of science writing by Richard Wrangham, there's a professor of anthropology, who was, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Hooven's professor, and also as a uh, scientific mystery story by Daniel Gilbert, another Harvard professor. These are both on blurbs on the back of her book. And <laughs> Right. We notice, of course, that uh, the, the use of the word story in the title is the story of testosterone. So this is a book which brings science to the public, you could say. But it's based on scientific research of her own. The book begins with Dr. Hooven in Africa early in the morning collecting samples of chimpanzee pee. So that, and she's wrote her dissertation on, uh, on male spatial ability, so showing a, a certain long time interest in the question between of the differences between men and women. And she has a number of articles as well, including one on interceptive awareness. Sounds like a, a football book. But um, uh, so her, her, this new book has, has acquired um, has, has received much attention because it, it, it seems to confront uh, the theory behind uh, the gender neutral society that America seems to be building now. And it attacks, or at least questions, a major element of wokeness, uh, which says that the differences between men and women are uh, minimal and deserve to be minimized to the extent- that You can say attacks. Yeah, all right, attacks. <laughs> so that <laughs> Dr. Hooven, you could say, is uh, a victim of feminine aggression or that testosterone attracts aggression as well as producing it. So in doing this book, Dr. Hooven seems to have discovered that uh, to somewhat perhaps to her surprise that she's an author and to her dismay that she's a political figure. So, Carol Hooven. Thank you so much, Professor Manfield, and um, thank you for having me here. This is such a great opportunity, and um, I love that introdu introduction. It's just a great segue to where I'm going to go next, which is back to uh, Uganda, because that is where my interest in testosterone started, and that was in uh, around 1998 and 1999. So I love what I do. I love teaching. I love advising undergrads. And so many of them are worried what they're gonna, about what they're going to do with their lives and how will be, they be able to comp, accomplish their goals with a B minus. Um, but I was somebody who was not straight and narrow, uh, especially in high school. And then when I graduated from college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I got a job and I worked and I lived and I traveled a lot and read a lot and then quit my job. I decided I wanted to research the evolutionary underpinnings of human behavior. And that's super broad, but that's just really what I became interested in after all my traveling and reading. That was the one question that I wanted to try to answer. So I applied to Harvard, uh, the biological anthropology program and got rejected, but I now didn't have a job and um, <laughs> didn't. so don't do things in that order, as I say um, in the book. 
But finally, I really just pestered. I was, you know, I was like, look, you don't understand. I already quit my job. This is what I want to do. What do I have to do to make this happen? So finally, Richard Rangham offered me this job out in um, Western Uganda, working for the Kibali Chimpanzee Project. This was a dream come true. I really, honestly, I, I'm a crier. So if I start tearing up when I'm talking about stuff, just ignore me. That's just what I do. Okay. So um, I got this opportunity and a lot of people were extremely worried because it was a really, really violent time in that region of Africa. There were literally beheadings and limbs being chopped off and, you know, male perpetrated violence. It's, uh, there was some of, of course, there are some violence that uh, women were involved in, but the, where I was in this part of the world, this was primarily males carrying out really horrific acts of violence and sexual assault. That is still going on to some degree to this day, but I was supposed to go out for a year. I ended up spending eight months um, basically in the jungle following chimpanzees around because I, I had to get evacuated early because uh, there were threats there were some rebels moving towards the part of the forest that uh, I was in. So I was supposed to go out there and learn how to do research and also help. I had a little bit of a business background, so I was supposed to help run the um, project. I did not know what I was doing. I have to say, I had to really learn how to do research. Um, I didn't end up publishing any of the data I collected because again, I just wasn't properly trained in how to collect data properly and do observational research. However, I spent every day observing chimps and uh, what I saw as anybody who spent any time with uh, pretty much wild primates, but especially chimp chimpanzees will tell you, their minds are blown by how similar they are to humans. Of course, there are differences, you know, I'm not even going to go into all of the differences that there are, but they're so much like us that it's incredible because they don't share any aspect of human culture. Yet what I saw with my own two eyes, so there's a bunch of, you know, lots and lots of research on uh, non-human primate behavior, but there's also anecdotes and my anecdotes are completely consistent with the research. So what I saw is how it is, which is that on average, so every time that I say there's a difference between in complex behavior between any groups, know that I mean on average. I'm not saying all individuals of group X do this, engage in this certain behavior and no individuals of group Y. I'm saying that there are broad patterns of behavior that differ on average, and they deserve an explanation. You know, you can't just take this stuff for granted and just say, this is how the world is. You want to dig in and see what is driving these differences in humans and in non-human animals. So what I saw was zero for eight months, zero physical aggression among the females. Now that is not the case again, in every single female chimp, female chimpanzees, just like female humans, depending on the circumstances, depending on the urgency and the needs and the threats to life and uh, or offspring, for instance, females are totally capable of extreme aggression. But on average, they're going to refrain from that behavior unless it's really ultra necessary um, for their survival or their offspring or relatives survival. The females spent their days relatively peacefully. I loved hanging out with them. It was always peaceful. It was always watching the kids play, watching the kids like climb all over their mothers and nurse. And it was quiet. If there were males around and if especially females were in estrus, it was exciting. Like it was males are screaming their heads off. They're threatening, they're competing, they're throwing things. They're having competing to have sex with the estrus females. The aggression, whether it's for status, which ultimately gets more mates, or whether it's for the right to mate right here, right now, there's a huge amount of aggression. They're not doing it all day, but when they do do it, it's incredibly exciting. And, uh, but otherwise they're just living their lives and the males and females can travel together and they're resting and eating and traveling. But the differences that we see that, you know, are very common that all researchers see are that the females are relatively peaceful and nurturing and the males are relatively aggressive and sex obsessed. That is what I saw. I saw one 
uh, really remarkable uh, beating, which was Imoso, who you saw on the previous slide, who was the dominant male. He was a nasty uh, chimp and he beat Utamba, that other female you just saw for nine minutes. I had never seen anything like this. It's fairly rare to see such an intense beating. And he used a weapon. He picked up a stick and beat her severely with a stick in addition to punching and kicking her, which was quite disturbing to see, but also, you know, extremely exciting. I have to say it's not exciting in humans. It's just disturbing. And the headline on the Time Magazine article that covered this was Wife Beaters of Kibali. Okay, so that's an anthropomorphic title. It's assuming that the same um, biological or evolutionary underpinnings explain both kinds of, you know, human interpersonal violence and the same thing in chimps. We don't know if that's true. That's something we want to explore. We want to collect data, observational, say, and hormonal and genetic to look at what the patterns are, to see how we can use that information to explain what we see uh, in humans. But the point is we have these parallel behaviors that are very similar. Of course, there's all kinds of differences depending on culture and time and place. Uh, but we see these broad patterns that are shared without a shred of uh, human culture. And that needs an explanation. <clears throat> I assume most of you recognize this person, uh, Jerry Tubin, who made a mistake. <laughs> a big one. Uh, and nobody is going to worry that I would make the same mistake on a Zoom call. Uh, however, there are men who could kind of imagine doing this themselves, or maybe even have done it themselves and didn't get caught. But there are really, this is not something that women do. Women masturbate less overall, and they're not, you know, doing it on a Zoom call is just so much less likely, which is why Jerry, I just said he made a mistake. It's not like it's bizarre or so surprising. It's men and women have different uh, sexualities. Men want more sexual partners. They have higher sex drives. This is not, again, something that is uh, unique to humans. We see similar patterns in non-human animals, and we're just not super surprised that this happens. We just think, holy crap, how could he have been so stupid? Not like, wow, that's weird that a guy was masturbating on a Zoom call. It is a little bit, but it's not, you know, uh, completely inconceivable. Um, so I am not going to be talking about sex today. Uh, but I just want you to know that it, that is something I cover in the book that is an extremely large and robust sex difference that is present co cross-culturally consistent with non-human animals. And it's linked very strongly to male-male aggression, which is, is what I'm going to focus on. So in humans, we have, uh, this is a, you know, regardless of the explanation, there is just no dispute that one of the largest and most consistent sex differences is in physical aggression. And that's important that I'm talking about physical aggression. There's all kinds of other aggression that is not executed physically that does not put the perpetrator at physical risk. So women are ex very capable as uh, most people can see, like especially through social media of extreme aggression, uh, but they tend not to put their own physical safety at, at risk when competing aggressively. So you can see just this is uh, data that reflects cross-cultural trends. The numbers vary, but the across cultures, but the uh, pattern does not. Male physical aggression, whether it's rape, murder, assault, theft, fraud, these are crime statistics. They're very robust, very reliable. Uh, this pattern exists across cultures where males commit almost 100% of the rapes, 95% uh, of the murders. As the physical aspect of the aggression declines, so does the male proportion decline. Females can also commit uh, crimes, even aggressive crimes, but when it places them at high physical risk, the numbers are much, much lower. But this pattern of males just blowing away females in terms of physical aggression exists everywhere and has always uh, existed. How do we explain that? This needs explanation, not just because it's a problem and it's something that we want to address, but also because it's interesting, it's fascinating. What is it that's motivating these large uh, social trends that we see, these patterns that we see all over the world? 
So obviously I think testosterone as seen through an evolutionary lens, particularly sexual selection is one of the most powerful ways we can understand these large uh, patterns of behavior, particularly sex differences. So I just want to show you another non-human animal that is not a primate, that is a seasonal breeder. And um, so just to this, just to contextualize what testosterone is, how it operates in many, many animals, this just spectacular illustration of this is red deer who, who I went to um, visit, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide as part of the research for this book. I went to the Scottish Isle of Rum. That was a just unbelievable trip. I recommend it to anyone uh, to just take the train through the Scottish Highlands to get there. That was pretty incredible. But what uh, testosterone is, first of all, it's largely produced in the testes in males. Um, females produce about 50% of their testosterone in their ovaries. The other 50% comes from their adrenal glands. Males produce a very small amount of uh, proportion of testosterone from their adrenal glands. The bulk comes from the testes. It is a derivative of cholesterol. It is a uh, molecule that I'll show you on the next slide, but you can, so first of all, what it is, is a reproductive hormone. It's so the aggression that I'm talking about is a reproductive strategy. Females have other behaviors they can engage in to maximize their reproductive fitness or their reproductive success. Males frequently need to use uh, aggression to maximize their reproductive success. They need the body, they need the behavior, and they need the ability to engage in that type of competition. They also need sperm in order to carry out their mission, which is to impregnate as many females as possible. Now, humans do not use that same strategy because males actually invest in their offspring. That's a whole different story, but male in humans, there's a big, big uh, difference in strategies among males. Some males are not using these aggressive, highly competitive strategies. Some males are, but in a species like the red deer, all the males have to compete. Uh, and what testosterone does in the breeding season, which is called the rut, it's happening right now. And it's fascinating because the antlers, the roaring, the uh, mane here on the neck to make the neck muscles look big. Why does it, the neck muscles need to look big? Because this is how the males are competing with, with each other, with their incredibly sharp, strong antlers, with the muscles in their neck. Um, and just, and they're also making sperm. All of these traits are promoted by the seasonal rise in testosterone. When testosterone falls, when there's no females to get pregnant, then the males don't need testosterone. They don't need to fight aggressively. Testosterone falls, the antlers fall off. The sperm are no longer made. The testes regress, the muscles uh, decline. So energy is spent in these ways testosterone directs how energy is spent in these animals to maximize uh, reproduction. And this is a picture I took from the little cliff I was sitting on. This is Wisdom 11. Here, he was the dominant male. He had 20 hinds. That means, so he was holding them in his harem. They are so, they're very small compared to him. You have other males up in the hills. I, this was such, so amazing to see. He's holding these hinds. He's hardly ever eating. He's watching out for all these other males who are trying to mate with his hinds. They keep kind of trying to challenge him and run down and steal a mating or challenge him to take his hinds. So he's constantly, he's constantly looking out for other males uh, who are going to challenge him. He has to always be ready to fight and he has to be ready to mate. And testosterone does those two things. So it's coordinating this uh, physical um, ability to fight, the weapons necessary to fight, the psychological motivation to fight, sperm production, all of this. Testosterone is doing uh, all of this. And it's not just red deer and it's not just chimps, it's also us. So one thing that people may not appreciate is that testosterone creates these differences in us and in non-human animals in juveniles before puberty, 
So that's interesting. How is that happening? Why do, why do little girls, of course, these are extreme, these are stereotypes that I'm showing you about play, but they, there are some truth to these stereotypes. Girls do play in less physical ways than boys. You would, it would be much more rare to see a group of girls just choose to play by tackling each other for hours sometimes. That's just typically not how girls play. And it's not how non-human female animals play relative to males. So these, again, these are not just human behaviors. This, what you see here is practice for what you just saw, say in the red deer, something along those lines, physical competition, male, male competition, it's practice. It has to be fun. Juvenile male animals have to learn how to do that. Testosterone promotes that. Uh, and then we see adult humans and we see the effects of testosterone on their bodies that happen uh, in puberty. You see the uh, beard on the man, receding hairline, larger muscles, bigger body size. Again, these are relatively permanent actions of testosterone that uh, begin in puberty because we're not seasonal breeders and you can, and the males cannot tell when the females are ovulating and are able to get pregnant. So they're kind of uh, have high testosterone from puberty on. And just tiny bit of uh, actual science here, just in case anyone's interested, testosterone is, I will say, a miracle molecule, partly because it is so powerful. The reason it can have all these different kinds of actions that I talked about that start in utero, that affect childhood behavior, that then coordinate all of these different kinds of adaptations in puberty and maintain male reproductive, develop and maintain male reproductive physiology and secondary sex characteristics. That's like the muscles and the beard and the body size. That is because testosterone is a steroid hormone derivative of cholesterol, it's fatty, and it can mush in with other fatty stuff. So another fatty thing is the cell membrane. That could be neurons in the brain. That could be uh, muscles. Any um, cell membrane is, has, uh, I'll just say is fatty. And that means that hormones, this is what's called, uh, it's lipophilic, that the steroid hormones can go right through cell membranes. They can go right into the nervous system. That's unlike many other kinds of molecules uh, in our body. Goes into the brain, goes into the body, gets right into cells interacts with its receptor. And what is amazing is it's what's called acts as a transcription factor. That means it can interact with DNA inside our cells and control the way that genes are uh, transcribed into proteins. These are potent and long lasting effects on our bodies and behavior. And if anyone has questions about that, I'm happy to talk more about that. Uh, but it, this is part of why it can have these really profound and long lasting uh, systemic effects. So there are two times when testosterone has its um, most influential actions. So this is the percent of the maximum testosterone level that a male will have in his lifetime. And interestingly, the fetal testes are pumping out a lot of testosterone uh, almost up to hundred percent of the maximum. Like I have a boy, I have a 12 year old boy, Griffin. And it was bizarre to me when I was pregnant with him. And it's still bizarre to me to know that his testes are pumping out huge amounts of testosterone inside of his mother's body. Me that's shaping the development of his penis of his, uh, reproductive system and shaping his brain. And we'll talk about how that works. There's another peak right after birth that, uh, we don't know a whole lot about. We're learning more and more about what the significance of this peak is that happens about three months after birth. Then you have a period of quiescence. Then you have another rise in testosterone during puberty. And then you have the slow decline of adulthood, not like you're falling off a cliff, uh, kind of like what happens in women, which ha who have much, much lower testosterone overall. Okay. So let's take a look. So those are the two most significant periods. So we just really briefly want to show you something about the importance of this pubertal sort of effects of testosterone that set the stage for juvenile and adult behavior. This is really important. People don't appreciate that this pre or perinatal, that means around 
uh, birth, testosterone uh, has really important effects on behavior. So we talked about play fighting. I told you that it's not just humans who do this. There's a sex difference in non-human animals. You can do experiments on rats to see how this stuff works. So it's not socialization. Okay. Socialization can budge around the expression of these behaviors, but we know that this happens in all kinds of animals and from experiments where researchers manipulate testosterone levels in utero or shortly after birth, depending on the species, you can manipulate the expression of this masculine behavior. So rough and tumble play is a masculine behavior that is ultimately controlled by perinatal testosterone exposure. You remove the testosterone, they start playing like the females. If you give a female uh, high levels of testosterone in or around uh, birth utero, sorry, she will start playing like a boy. Okay. And here you just see the typical moves and you can tell they're kind of having fun, but that this is very similar to what my son used to do. And he's not even an athletic sort of like super boy, boy. Um, okay. So we also have tons of evidence from humans that prenatal testosterone also shapes that early play behavior. And I'm just showing you one of many, many studies, uh, about how that works. So what you're looking at here are, uh, there, this study was done on a population of girls who have a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The most important point is that these girls are exposed to unusually high levels of testosterone in utero. These are corrected at birth and otherwise they're nor, you know, totally normal girls. But what is different about them is that they play more like boys and they're more likely to grow up to be lesbians and they're more likely to um, be overrepresented in male typical professions. And this is where this condition is totally normalized at birth. They have normal um, estrogen and testosterone levels from then on. So it's specifically this early exposure that changes, uh, that seems to impact their masculinity basically. So here, what you're looking at is, boy, is toys that boys typically prefer, which is like um, guns or trucks or airplanes. This, these sounds like stereotypes, but these are just the toys that the sexes have shown that, uh, they prefer. It's not like the experimenters are just randomly choosing these. And then you have dolls and makeup kits and tea sets, um, for girls. And what you see is that if you just let the kids choose the toys that they want, the girls who were exposed to high levels of testosterone in utero, that is the CAH girls, spend more time playing with the boys' toys than do the girls who are not affected. You can just ignore the uh, unaffected boys here. They're just playing with boys' toys and not playing with girls' toys. The unaffected girls, just typical girls, spend a lot of time with the girls' toys, but the CAH girls spend less time with the girls playing with the girls' toys and more time uh, playing with the boys toys. So we have good evidence to this. Again, this is just a sliver in humans that this prenatal T makes a big difference in, um, the masculinization of behavior. Then we just have, this is just a, um, simple graphic just to show that these again, secondary sex characteristics that are the traits that kind of allow us to obviously, you know, differentiate, uh, men and women happen because of the second rise in testosterone at puberty. It's tough to relate this to aggression in humans because we can't really um, do the same kinds of experiments that we can do on non-human animals. Uh, and we know that there are these large sex differences aggression in aggression that do emerge at puberty and coincide with the pubertal rise in testosterone. But what we, what we do have is sports. There's tons of data on sports. And I have a chapter on this because I am sort of obsessed with the pushback that uh, people are getting for just saying males beat women in sports. Males are bigger, stronger, and more powerful. And I am irritated by the amount of pushback there is to this with people saying this is cultural. Of course, it's not cultural. That's an insult to me as a woman. I'm I'm strong and athletic, but every male could beat me almost, you know, and in, including my son in a couple of years, who's only 12, that's just how it is. These are biological differences. They are caused by testosterone and there's just no doubt about it. So over here is the sex difference in, or sex difference, this should be sex really, sex difference in 
uh, sporting ability and testosterone levels over time. So this is age down here on the X axis. And you can see as testosterone goes up with age, so does the male advantage. This is the percent of male advantage in various sports, swimming, uh, running and jumping, which requires more power. So if there's a lot of strength and power, as opposed to endurance, you're going to see a much larger male advantage. Not only do we have this correlational data, we have tons of data on people who, especially in transgender people, alter their testosterone levels, um, or people who have, you know, very atypical levels of testosterone. There's just no doubt that testosterone is responsible for these uh, power differences. And this is one way that in our modern human culture, men, largely men, women also obviously participate in sports and are very competitive and very talented and passionate. But if uh, you look at the economics here, that uh, male attendance and participation in sports just blows away that of females. And I think this is a way, uh, a socially sanctioned way for males to be able to aggressively compete for status and in a, in a physical way. And so we have a lot of data here that shows that testosterone uh, underpins that very, very large sex difference. So just briefly, this is a tiny slice again of the pushback, which I address directly in my book to the idea that testosterone or genes or anything biological or evolutionary really does explain um, most of these sex differences in behavior that I have talked about. People are scared, I think, of the implications. So Katrina Karkazis wrote this book on testosterone. The um, and she said, when people think about testosterone, aggression is one of the first things that comes to mind. But when you look at the evidence, there's not good evidence at all. And Angela Saini, who wrote the book Inferior, said there are a few psychological differences between the sexes. And the differences that are seen are heaven, heavily shaped by culture, not biology. Again, this is a small sliver of the mostly, I will say, feminist pushback to the kinds of uh, things that I'm talking about in my book. And they get a lot of press. So if you read, say, the New York Times, these are the women uh, who are quoted in the New York Times. And um, people seem to be very, many people seem to be very comfortable with these kinds of explanations because they sort of, I think, give us what I would say is a false hope that we can address male aggression if it's cultural, mostly culturally influenced. I think that's doesn't make any sense at all because changing culture is no easy task and it's just wrong. Um, and I think there are a couple of fears that motivate this kind of pushback. One is that biological explanations for sex differences legitimize those differences, sort of will maintain the status quo uh, and mean that, well, this, this behavior is really should be acceptable because it's natural. So that's what's called the naturalistic fallacy. And that's just a logical flaw. And I think the second worry is that people will think, well, if it's biologically based, there's nothing we can do about it. That's just wrong. Uh, and there's no evidence for that. There's tons of evidence for the opposite conclusion. If you just look across cultures, uh, what you see here are uh, the homicide rate um, in deaths per 100,000 people. These are the areas of the world that have higher rates. These are the areas of the world with lower rates as the color gets lighter. And we know that things like um, customs, laws, even um, annual temperatures, you know, aspects of ecology, socioeconomic status, time period, all of these things um, affect the expression of this tendency that I think males have. And we can kind of rein that in through with culture and laws and customs, or we can kind of give it free reign, which in some parts of the world, of course, there is free reign. And uh, so we know that it, just because something is biologically influenced does not mean that we have no control over it. Clearly we do. So that's just an error, I think, of uh, reasoning and a failure to appreciate the evidence. And testosterone and manliness, uh, as Harvey Mansfield said uh, in his book on manliness, sorry, uh, 
seems to be about 50, 50, good and bad. So I want to make sure that we don't leave out the positive aspects of manliness. And I talk about that in my book a little bit. It's a fact that if you just start paying attention to who is risking their lives, I get this makes me a little teary because I'm so, it upsets me so much that men are getting a really bad rap when it is mostly men, women do this too, but it is really mostly men who will risk their lives to save the lives of others, even perfect strangers. And they are the ones who are putting themselves at physical risk to it, it to purposely injure others sometimes, but in the defense of those that they feel uh, they're protecting too. So I don't want to forget or have anyone forget about how testosterone potentially might motivate some of these really positive, protective, heroic, even innovative, I have to say, uh, competition can lead to a lot of Im- innovation. I think it's totally fine for us to think about how that might work. I don't think that's sexist. I think it's interesting and important. Um, and there, so I'll leave it at that. I've given you evidence from human and non-human animals. There's Griffin from a uh, few years ago, a basically gentle kid who loves to just pound the crap out of his friends <laughs> for some reason. And, um, and thank you so much, uh, to Anna and Harvey and the program on constitutional government, which I have to admit, I never heard of before, but thank you so much for having me. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, talking with you about all of this. And I, I see there's some, Ooh, Larry Summers, some questions in the chat. Ooh, oh, we got, okay. Can I go to some chat questions or how do you want to do this? You certainly can. You are, you're a free woman. You can do whatever you like, um, <laughs> but make sure, um, raise your hands uh, if you want to ask a question in person. And we have a lot of people. So you know I'm to who I'm talking to. Do not ask a long question. I will cut you off. We have too many people. <laughs> Okay. Do lesbians have a high and sustained level of testosterone? This is a great question. Um, I have a lot on this question in my book and the answer is no, there is no evidence for that. But the reason you might be suspecting that is because there's some ways in which lesbians are masculinized relative to heterosexual women. There are, um, within uh, homosexual people, there are different styles. So there are some lesbians who are much more masculinized than other lesbians. I'm, I'll just say it. Uh, there are butch and say lipstick lesbians, just to use two terms there. Not everyone likes those terms, but the research here is difficult because not everyone is separating the populations into say more masculinized people versus less masculinized people. So if there is a relationship, I think you're only going to find it if you do the research properly. But even the, when people do look at that, there's no evidence for higher levels of circulating testosterone. There is, however, some evidence of higher prenatal testosterone. So that um, what you want to look for is gender nonconformity in childhood for that is a very strong predictor of homosexual behavior or identity in adulthood. So kids, boys who are less masculine um, as kids who prefer to play with girls who don't love rough and tumble play are more likely to grow up to be gay adults and girls who are more like boys and want to play with boys and seem really, you know, tough and tomboyish are more likely to grow up to be lesbians. So that does suggest that it's that prenatal testosterone that uh, makes a large contribution to um, sexual orientation in adulthood. And I think that's fascinating and uh, important. Um, And then can testosterone account for differences in intellectual capability? For example, the percentage of women engineers is much lower than men. So I could go on again, because this is what I basically did my dissertation on. And I mean, not basically, but around this area, 
And I actually didn't cover it in the book, which is ironic because that's where my, you know, most of my research has been at least early on. The reason I didn't go into this too much in the book is because the evidence is kind of all over the place. What I wanted to cover in the book is where we see the, the largest sex differences and we have really strong evidence for to implicate testosterone as being at the root of those differences. I do just, I do think that yes, testosterone does contribute strongly to uh, differences in representation in different professions, but we have to be careful about the capacity, assuming that those differences are due to capacity. So there is a literature that suggests that testosterone can shape interests and dispositions. So novelty seeking, how much physical activity you want, whether you want uh, to be with other people or working with things. And it is, seems that testosterone contributes to, uh, pushes people in the direction of less sort of relationship oriented, more thing, abstract reasoning, et cetera, oriented. So there's a complicated relationship with uh, capacity because it's really hard to tell what's causing what. Um, the uh, mental rotation piece, which I, I won't go into, but there is a massive that the largest sex difference in cognition is an aspect of spatial ability called mental rotation. That may be an ability that underlies some of these other, um, or is strongly related to say, um, engineering. We don't understand exactly how that works, but I think it's quite possible that that does have to do with, uh, testosterone differences. Again, it may not be them, uh, testosterone acting directly on the parts of the brain say that would be, uh, that would underlie those abilities. It might have something uh, more indirect via say dispositional differences. Um, Jeffrey, and then I'll go back to some of the, one of the chat questions, if that's all right with you guys. Jeffrey, make it short. All right, all right, I'm, I'm, so I'm sorry. And I will be, I'll be short. So this is a, it is gonna be an inside baseball question though, a little bit. So, um, you know, obviously, Cultural anthropology is famous for kind of going off the rails with science in the 90s and postmodernism. And lately, I've seen the kind of biological anthropology is going similarly, it seems. You know, uh, current anthropology uh, from the Wintergreen Institution had a symposium early this year, led by Augustine Fuentes, that kind of pushed back against all of the biological yes. Yes. masculine stuff. So, I, so to be succinct, what, how do you, do you see that happening? Do you see there kind of being a, a turn kind of towards the cultural anthropological skepticism of, I mean, science is hard to imagine that, but, but, or, or, or you know, what do you see going on there? I can tell, I mean, I, I'm a little, um, hesitant to kind of get into that. I have been paying a lot of attention to Augustin Fuentes, um, and, that sort of aspect of, would you say cultural or biological anthropology? I can't remember how he actually categorizes himself. I think he's technically a biological anthropologist, but you know, I, I it seems like- It's just there's woke. Some there's some just woke right. infiltration there. I, I don't know how else to say it. I don't love that word, but I'm um, someone who just prioritizes sticking to the evidence and trying to find the truth. And I don't think that's exactly what's happening there. It seems like there's a agenda uh, yeah, that's a big, big issue. I, I don't know what, what, uh, I, I don't even know how to, um, characterize what is happening there. I hope that's sort of an isolated set of incidents. <laughs> I don't know how else to talk about it, but I hear you. And, or I don't know what your view on the whole thing is, but I, uh, there are some problems in my field. Like I, I don't, um, that's why I've been attacked because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ideology. Anyway. Catherine. Sorry. That wasn't a very good, a very evasive answer, but can I do this Avi Nelson one? Oh, am I not supposed to say the name? No, no. You, you, no. Oh, is that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Catherine. Oh, was Larry Summers right okay. when he raised? Okay. Sorry? I just, it's, it's, I'm Avi Nelson. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Was Larry Summers right when he raised the question that scientific ability may be gender related? So if you Google my name, Harvard Crimson and Larry Summers, you will see that when I was a grad student in, uh, I guess that was 2003, 2004, 
and this, I think it was 2004 that that happened, that Larry Summers made some statements at a conference, raising questions about um, the role of bio, basically biology versus culture in explaining the underrepresentation of women in STEM fields. And the conference was centered around trying to solve that problem. Larry Summers suggested that there may be some uh, contribution of what he called intrinsic differences. He talked about differences in the distribution of abilities, which, um, you know, uh, males in, in many, many traits include behavioral traits and, and physical traits. The distribution of those traits is a flat, much flatter bell curve than it is for women, uh, which is a narrower distribution. So what that leads to is you have more people, more men who are really struggling at the low end. And then you have more men than women who are represented at the very high end of achievement and ability. So, you know, that could by itself just, just say means, say for engineering ability or, or uh, theoretical physics, say means, but um, it actually physical, uh, theoretical physics, I don't know if the means are the same, but even if they were, if you have a flatter distribution among men, you're going to see that there's more males for every female out at the high end where MIT and Harvard are hiring. That by itself could explain why we uh, have an overrepresentation of men. But the point is, uh, so I don't know if you call that scientific ability, but if you call that scientific ability, then yes, he's right. But he was also talking about interests and lifestyle. The women are the ones who have the babies. They're the ones who nurse the babies. And they might want not want to be in this competitive, hard driving environment for lots of different reasons. Um, so he also suggested that he 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 really focused on this difference in uh, distributions. He was totally right, and I told this to the Crimson, and then people were not happy with what I said. But I said, of course, he should be talking about this. This is totally reasonable. It's a reasonable hypothesis. If we want to solve a problem, we need to entertain our reasonable hypotheses. I got a lot of pushback as a grad student for saying that in 2004. And I have not changed one bit. Like that's exactly how I still feel. And people are trying to get me not to say this stuff, but of course we should have conversations about, you know, evidence and hypotheses. So there's the answer there. Mute. Hi, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I was, it's, I don't know if you can see me, <laughs> Catherine. I can see you. Um, hi. Okay. Hi. Um, so that was very interesting. I was just wondering, you, I know testosterone is your main emphasis, but it seemed like you were going sort of in the direction of saying that sex differences generally are caused by presence and absence of testosterone. And you kind of didn't say, didn't talk about estrogen. I'm just wondering, is estrogen a less significant hormone, um, or is it just your your focus is aggression? So you talked about testosterone. My focus isn't aggression per se. It was for this talk. Um, my focus is testosterone. So whatever it's doing in humans, I want to understand. So I didn't really come at this from trying to understand sex differences so much. That's just where it leads. Mm -hmm. I am somewhat interested in estrogen. Um, I think the uh, effects of testosterone are so important because they do, men do dominate in the, you know, um, women basically, and the rest of the, you know, they dominate institutions, they dominate our lives in lots of different ways. And some of those ways are good. Some of those ways are bad. And I think um, it's very, it's a powerful hormone in shaping culture and institutions. So is female behavior and it's underappreciated and understudied. So, um, and I don't see, be, I think because women don't have the power that men do say institutionally, we have the power in terms of uh, what we can do biologically and, um, some women have lots of power, like, you know, Margaret Thatcher did. And, you know, there's lots of examples of very powerful women, but I don't see that as strongly in that women's um, style as being as strongly influenced by estrogen as I see male behavior uh, being so strongly influenced by testosterone. That might not be right. 
Um, we just, part of the problem is that women are understudied for all the reasons I'm saying, and I'm falling right into that trap of wanting, even when I was with the chimps, I wanted to follow the males because they were more interesting and exciting to me than the females. So I, as a researcher, am part of the problem in that um, I'm not attracted to studying women. I'm interested, but it's like, I think the man thing is much more exciting for me and important because I'm not one. And I want to understand who are these other people who do seem so different from me. Um, I could like talk with you about this for a long time because I think it's a totally valid and important question. And I do want to understand the way in which my curiosity and my work is just not uh, doing, I don't know if you know Sarah Hardy, she's an anthropologist. There are a lot of female anthropologists who've really exposed how the male male dominated anthropology has led to an basically an exclusion of the importance of female behavior and estrogen and like how female reproductive strategies can shape societies and um so that's all you know incredibly important it's just not what i'm focused on and i don't yeah i have like a great reason you can go raise your hands but in the meantime carol you can you take the questions from the chat Okay, so Avi has another one. I'm gonna, okay. Um, are there studies of gender differences in verbal aggression or professional competition? Yes. So uh, <sighs> verbal aggression, um, I don't know if this person wants to elaborate on their question, but there are lots of studies. And, and the main finding is that females, whether kids or women are, it can be extremely aggressive in a, again, in a way that doesn't put their um, physical selves at risk. This is passive aggression or indirect aggression, and it can be extremely cruel. So being ostracized from your peer group can be, is one of the most painful things that people can go through. And women, girls and women do this more than men do who are more likely to confront each other directly, resolve a status conflict, and then kind of know where they stand and repair. Females have a much harder time doing that. Um, and females will also denigrate other women's appearance and reputation in a way that seems like just clear mate, mate competition. Um, so there are also studies of professional competition. There's a lot of literature on how uh, female bosses treat their female subordinates versus male bosses treating female subordinates. Basically, there's some work that shows that's very controversial that it's if you're a woman, it's better for your career to have a male uh, boss, for instance. It's, there's work that shows that this is the case in academia. People were not happy with that. That was a big study. There were um, some uh, controversies about the legitimacy of, of that study, but there is lots of work on that. Um, yeah. And, and I don't know if verbal aggression means anger. There's not a big sex difference in, um, anger. So there's the, the sex difference is about basically putting yourself at physical risk. I have a follow-up mm -hmm. question to that, Carol. Yeah. Follow-up question. So we see more women, especially in academia, right? The percentage in administration, but also in many fields, has vastly increased over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, does that account, you think, for some of the, the, the differences now that people are taking things out on each other? Um, it's just a shot. Do you mean... What, um, so you're saying there's more women in academic administration and in also in um, certain fields, right? Does that can you see has it been studied whether you can see that academic competition, institutional um, over time, is domination? I don't know rules that this has changed over time. And would you say that might correlate with a greater number of women in? academia or in these instances. Yeah, that I don't, I don't know, but that seems like a fascinating study. If that has not been done, that needs to be done. That would be really, really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of work on um, Joyce Benenson is someone who's done a lot of work um, on looking at different styles of communication, different styles of conflict resolution, and they're just huge differences. And so I, I would, suspect that, yeah, there are 
going to be differences in, um, say, institutional communication or whatever you want to call it as the proportion of women increases. And that seems like some, I, I don't know of any work on that, but there might very well be. And if there isn't, there should be. Um, Carly. Sorry, I guess I had my question is, uh, I suppose, follows from Anna's or is perhaps similar to Anna's, but um, maybe even on a larger scale. So as you were speaking about the, you know, the um, behaviors that, you know, we tend to associate with women versus men and the kinds of aggression that women participate in that men, you know, or that women tend to be unwilling to participate in, for example, that we tend to, uh, to stay away from physical aggression that will put our lives at risk and that sort of thing. I was thinking that, <clears throat> uh, that in say over the past several decades, at least in the United States and probably in Europe and uh, in other places like this, um, regimes as a whole seem to be moving in what you could characterize as a more womanly direction, right? We have a distaste for physical punishments, right? Distaste for death penalties, um, distaste for um, <clears throat> use of force by police officers, for war, um, for, uh, you know, and, and actually and, and in, there's sort of an increase in a willingness to exercise sort of social ostracization, um, you know, to so are you cancel talking people about and long, things like that. Yeah, I'm just about the long trajectory we, of history. Well, like maybe not that, years. you know, I'm not going to say throughout human history. Let's just say even in the past, like, 50 years. Um, if, you know, if if those kind, if so, if, if the sort of male kind of aggression, we have less and less of a taste for it, and we're moving in a more kind of female aggressive direction, I guess, for lack of better words. Um, I was I was wondering if, you know, what you make of that, especially, you know, since, yes, there are more women participating at higher levels of, you know, everything, not just academia, but it's, you know, we're still, there's still, you know, we're still generally male dominated. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll stop there. And I guess that's yeah, just yeah, a no, question that's about how that those individual, or, you know, the, the, the individual, you know, biological differences translate into group behaviors and, and things like that. Yeah. I, that's a super interesting question. I did, I admit that I stayed away from those large, like questions just like that in the book, because they're so hard to answer with good evidence. You know, you really have to speculate and I didn't want to do too much of that kind of speculation, but now that you're that's asking, <laughs> I mean, no, but, no, but I'm happy to just tr try to answer it. Um, I do. The one thing is that women who achieve positions of power may very well be exceptionally masculine because in, in you know, many ways, in order to be a successful woman in, you know, leading an institution or a country, you have to have a lot of masculine traits. Maybe you, know, you have to fit into that mold because that is the mold. Um, it would be interesting if that weren't the case and, and maybe that isn't the case in some leaders and I just don't know enough about it that use more typically feminine styles of leadership. I'm not sure what that would look like. I think that would be really interesting. Um, and I also think that some of the trends you're talking about, say in the last 20, 30 years, we don't know what is going on exactly because we're getting so much through social media and we're getting a little videos and news reports of what's happening in the world that doesn't actually represent people's attitudes um, or shifting policies or, um, so I don't know that it's true. It, I mean, you know, Steve Pinker would say like over the long historical trajectory, we are becoming gentler and more moral. I don't know. I'm not sure if, that's if, true. <laughs> Yeah. So you disagree with that? Probably. Yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of people do. And, and, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, I do think that 
the internet and social media has got to be really important here um, in terms of shaping the way that we perceive obviously what's happening in the world, but also allowing women in particular, there's a lot of work on this now, how um, women are competing with other women uh, and punishing them on social media in ways that are totally non-physically aggressive, but that's not exactly answering your question. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hear what anyone else has to say about that. I think it's a, a really important question and sort of out of, yeah, I, I don't think I can do it justice. Avi. Okay. Um, the question I have is, I noticed that in the pictures of the animals, especially with that red deer, you had this big male with all the antlers and all the females were just grazing and being very quiet. And there was no, there may be competition among females somehow to attract the attention of the male, but there doesn't seem to be any competition with the females competing with the males. Now there is in human society. And the question is first, do you see anything like that in the animal kingdom? And second, is this somehow also accountable uh, by testosterone levels or, or something else? So tell me more about the first question. Um, so it's true. So females will compete at low levels, even physically sometimes. Even the red deer will, will do have little um, scuffles and um, they might stand up on their hind legs and box a little bit, but it's really not going to be life threatening the way that like males will are trying to kill each other. You know, they will try to get one down on the ground and, and stab him with their antlers or poke an eye out or break a leg. Females aren't doing that, but they will compete for resources that they need. The main resource, what you might, so there's the similarity say between us potentially and chimps and red deer is territory. Males want territory. They want to stake out and defend their territory because females need to feed on that territory. Um, so the, when the females compete, they're not really competing for the male. They're competing. They're getting the male. They're getting the male's genes because he was the one who was able to successfully defend, say, a high quality territory. The females want that because that's where the good grass is. That's what's going to make them healthy. That's what's going to feed their babies. So females are choosing the male indirectly because they're choosing the stuff that he can give them. That happens in humans. I right. So we know. Asking. I'm yeah. Sorry. So, guess. and, but female humans, cause males, so only 5% in only 5% of mammals do males invest in their offspring. So females have a higher level of competition in humans because we are competing for the males who are going to be able to provide us with the resources that signal to us that we will be healthy and protected. And so will our offspring. Um, so we have, you know, have that mating psychology and there's more competition than among women for the highest quality mates, but in most of, you know, 95% of mammal mammalian species, the male, you're just getting sperm and the male can have as many mates say, as he can get. And like, if I'm a red deer, I don't care if he, ha if there's five other, if he's mating with five other red, red deer, cause I'm not really losing anything. It's not like a zero sum game here. sort of. In human society. Male females frequently compete with males. Is there oh compete with males? Okay. Yes. Is is there any? I didn't see it in the red deer, but is there any example in the animal kingdom where instead of a male to male confrontation or female to female confrontation, there's female to male confrontation? Do you mean like um interpersonal? violence, like relationship violence, because that is obviously a huge problem. It's a huge problem in primates. It's a huge problem in uh, human primates also. So, I mean, if you're talking about that kind of competition, males are constantly trying to control female sexuality and there's a battle there. Females want some degree of sexual freedom. It's in the male's reproductive interest to control sexual access to his mate or his perceived mate or desired mate. So there you have competition. You can get some very serious outcomes mm. from that. But would a female ever compete with a male for territory, say? Not that I know of, no. Because 
like with the chimps, just for an example, males cooperate like we see in humans, I think, in some aspects of war. Males will fight among themselves for mates, but when it comes to territory, they will cooperate to acquire and defend a territory because they are then defending the females who can use the resources on that territory. So that's our sort of evolutionary inheritance is that like in chimps, that the females, if they have a lot of fruit and they have a great territory, it's to all the males benefit because they can all increase their reproductive success if they defend a high quality territory. And that's when they will compete to fight neighboring males. Sorry, that's when they will cooperate, you know, really intensely with each other uh, to fight neighboring males. And they'll fight less intensely among each other for mating opportunities with the females that they are kind of holding in that large territory through comp- through um cooperation do females ever join in the in the battle i mean, I mean you yes know, occasionally they do it's uh, it's it depends occasionally they do um but not nearly as often as you know males do they're sort of required to cooperate and females are not rita oh and then susan um, yeah, I guess this is a similar sort of question, which is that you, you're speaking of all of these uh, behaviors that are conditioned by testosterone as being adaptive for things like mate, mate uh, selection and things like that. But then, you know, it seems that culture gets in the way for humans in a way that makes a lot of them really maladaptive. Like if you commit murder and you're in prison, it's going to be a lot harder yeah. for you to select a high quality mate. Yes. Uh, and so, I mean, I just wonder what what is it that they're adaptive to exactly? And yeah, does yeah. that has that changed in any way that keeps up with culture or is, wait does what was the last last part does that what does that change in a way that keeps up with the way that culture can obstruct what is originally adaptive like on the savanna or something like that uh, and if it doesn't then is there a sense in which we should intervene and yes, deto- yes, de- yes. testosterone some of these men okay you're to- everything you're saying is totally right. Um, And this is a big issue in biological anthropology is exactly what are we talking about when we're talking about the environment to which an animal is best adapted, right? So for most animals, it's just the environment that they're in roughly, but it's certainly not for us. We are very far from the environment that we, there isn't one environment that we are best adapted to, but it is something like living as hunter gatherers, you know, but there's a huge amount of variation, of course, in our um, evolutionary past and the environments that we would have been adapted to. But there are a few things that are obvious, like we wouldn't have easy access to resources. You can't just go and buy food and clothes. You wouldn't be interacting with strangers. You would be living among family, um, you know, and extended kin groups and having to find your food and compete with other people for resources like you know, to build your house or places to sleep or, you know, just like other animals or or the food that you need. Um, So there are all kinds of mismatch uh, problems that we face. Like you can just think about diet, right? So we have this huge obesity crisis. That's just an obvious mismatch example. And if you apply the mismatch uh, hypothesis or framework to thinking about aggression, there's a huge mismatch, right? Because you're right. Um, And I think that when we were living in smaller bands, the rules for, or the enforcement of, um, like if someone's breaking the rules, breaking the rules of how aggressive a male can be, bad things would happen to them. They might be killed. They might be sent out of the group. um, They might not be able to attain a mate. You know, there were sort of in a way, um, better control of certain kinds of aggression. Um, but that's hard to know, of course, because we only have a few extant hunter gatherers that are probably not representative of ones in our evolutionary past, but I think that, yeah. So, uh, uh, most like obviously, you know, rape is a very difficult, uh, topic here. There's a debate about whether rape is some sort of adaptation. There's a debate about, um, domestic violence, whether these arise somehow and are expressed in our environment because there was something adaptive about these behaviors in our evolutionary past. I think there's no question that male on male violence, 
not the way that we see it now, but the inclination to compete with other males physically for mates or resources to attain mates. Yeah, that is something that's deeply, you know, embedded in our evolutionary history and shapes our psychology. It is playing out in mostly ways that are maladaptive. But, you know, guys are going to the gym, like what's maybe guys are going to the gym and trying to get big and signal that they're able to do that stuff or they're playing sports, right? And they're like a famous uh, sports star or they're just really good at basketball in their neighborhood or whatever it is. All those things are still going to provide them reproductive benefits. So culture has shaped this stuff in some really, really interesting, complicated ways. But I think you're basically right that on the extreme end, of uh, male behavior that, of course, that's just not adaptive to be a super aggressive male. Even even like sports, I mean, that's like a long shot that it's going to provide you with a with mate selection or optimal mate selection because like if you're just in the neighborhood, nobody's going to see you and making the NBA is really hard. I don't Whereas, know about like, that. I going would say, to college yeah. and being a total dweeb who just manipulates numbers, like you might make a lot. I mean, there's a better chance that you'll make a lot more money. There, that's You're pointing out different strategies. So high testosterone motivates all kinds of different behaviors. And it depends on who you are and what your talents and psychology is. You know, some guys are going to do great being a dweeb. Some guys are going to do great just being a nice guy and committing himself to one mate and taking really great care of her. There are other guys who are just going to be great at maybe sports in their neighborhood and for their neighborhood, they're the star, you know, and they will be able to get the most mates in their neighborhood. Like it totally depends. Uh, men have a lot of different options. Okay, I'm going to cut in because Harvey yeah. is wanting to ask yeah. a question. Yeah. And hold on, hold on. We have Harvey, Susan, then we have Lior from the chat, then Amy, and then Jean. Okay. Uh, just very quickly on this, on this last point on reproductive success. Uh, but isn't it the case that, um, that uh, the sort of guy who sleeps around and seeks a variety of sexual partners in accordance with, with the Coolidge effect that you speak of in your book, yeah, yeah. Isn't, that, isn't it that the, the last thing he wants is reproductive success? That's right. What he wants is- He just wants to have a lot of sex. He wants to have a lot of status and he wants to have a lot of and, mates and he's and, not thinking about yes. babies. That's, that's right. That's, so that's, you don't have to want that. You just have to want sex and men want sex. Right, but still, and they might do whatever it takes to get it. But with human beings, it seems there's a difference between having sex and mating. Do you mean mating, like forming a mating bond? Right. That's, yeah, yeah, totally. Speaking, and there's also, you know, that's, yeah. yeah and that's really no, no, important. No, no, that's seeking another... reproduction. Seeking reproduction. Sorry? Having sex and- Oh, yeah. To make I mean, some guys, body. yeah. He's making. I think some men do, you know, many men consciously want to have a family and want to invest in their family and are excellent partners and mates. And that's a good, that's a really good reproductive strategy. But you were saying the guys who are playing the field are definitely not thinking about that. And that's right. And that's another strategy, but it's a higher risk strategy, right? It, you may do great. You may completely bomb out. You have to know what your um, talents are and where, where they can be appreciated and how you can put them to use. And um, that's one of the interesting things about men that's different from other animals where males don't invest in their offspring. Um, so I think that's a fascinating aspect of human culture. And of course, different cultures support males, you know, getting married and investing in their offspring and being loyal husbands and fathers in different ways. Some cultures don't support that at all and reward the, the player and other cultures are very invested in supporting, you know, a traditional family, say. Susan. Um, well, thank you. This is really interesting and it's great. You know, I think it's very important to push back against some kind of bland all purpose, you know, gender is social construction and all of that. But it seems so complicated <laughs> once you get to human beings. And partly it's because as, as you mentioned, we're not only like chimpanzees, but we're also right have some kind of genetic predisposition toward investment in offspring. And also That's there's right. probably lots of primates that were descend, you know, that were similar to that have simply gone extinct. 
One that hasn't are these famous bonobos who Bonobos, yeah. act very differently than chimpanzees. And you can connect our behavior with those as well. That's so I right. wonder if you could just say a little bit more of the kind of range of alternative drivers besides, firstly, but besides the sort of testosterone, estrogen balance, typical of chimpanzees <laughs> that we, yeah. some yeah. of us at least reflect, but also are you, do you presume that all evolution is gr driven by sexual selection? Because I gather there's a certain controversy over that as well, that some, you know, there may be other drivers having to do to, with group selection, say, or more general or behave. I mean, I, I don't, you know, this is not my field and I don't, but oh, I mean- Oh, no, no, the, you're the saying all the right argument things. so far is that sex selection is the driver. And I, I suspect yeah. that you're, you really are saying something more complicated. So I wonder if- I'm not, so I'm gonna start with the complexities last- out. Okay, I'm going to start with the last thing you said, and then we have we can work back, and you can remind me your other questions. I'll just do sexual selection and bonobos. So yes, when it comes to, and I'll just give you a simple answer, and then you can interject with um, more questions. But um, when it comes to sex differences in behavior that are consistent, cross cultural, have parallels with non human animals, yeah, that's sexual selection. I don't see any other explanation um, from an evolutionary point of view. Group selection is another ball game, but that is more sort of um, traditional natural selection for survival. And so you've got selection on what it takes to survive, and then you've got selection on what it takes to reproduce. And the, de the definition of sexual selection, you know, people, there's a little bit of dispute about exactly how to define it, whether it really applies to females who are not competing to mates or for mates so aggressively, or whether it really has to do with purely mating competition. But overall, I would say that, yeah, we want to be thinking about sexual selection and we can play around with exactly how you want to define that. Um, and then you ask this really, really good question about chimpanzees and bonobos. So I had experience with chimps. That's why I'm just talking about them as one example and where we have really obvious parallels with behavior. I'm not assuming that um, chimpanzees are the best um, species that we can use to sort of model our evolutionary history on or assume that, you know, we shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos. And we don't know what that common ancestor was and what it, exactly what it was like. It could be like both. It could be more like chimps. There's a lot of dispute about that. Um, the behaviors that we see in bonobos is one of them is they're much less aggressive. They're, uh, they do not have the same kinds of sex differences in testosterone as most other primates. They're very weird. They use sex rather than uh, aggression for the most part to resolve conflicts. They are... Um, some people say female dominant, some say that females are co-dominant with males. So they have a totally different system, but it does open up a whole set of questions about um, whether we could be more likely, more like bonobos. Uh, it does seem, there's a lot of kind of exciting, really interesting hypothesizing to do there, thinking about like um, this previous question, I can't remember now the name of the person who asked me, but something like what if um, females were able to really cooperate and um, run institutions and defend themselves against male aggression, say, because we cooperated really heavily like bonobo females do. Um, that's something we can sort of dream about and maybe try to make happen. Uh, but bonobos are a bit of a model for that. They, the idea is that their level of bonding with each other they, and using sex rather than aggression. There is aggression, of course, but they seem to keep male aggression at bay. Whereas in chimpanzees, males are just beating the crap out of females all the time and really controlling their sexual access to females. And in bonobos, you see much tighter bonding, which is only made possible by their ecology. So it just has to do with how where their food is, how dispersed and clumped it is. So females can stay together. Um, in bonobos, and they really can't stay together for feeding purposes in chimps. I mean, this is a whole long story. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. 
We have so many. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, can you read Lior's question in the chat? And then we have Amy and then Jean. Okay. Wait, who am I reading? Lior. Oh, Lior. How significant? Oh, this is great. How significant is the range of T levels within the category of men? Okay. Not significant. It's large. So I'll go into this. Um, to what extent can we predict social outcomes from these data? For example, if we detect an extremely high level of T in an infant, can we be more or less certain that this person will grow up to be an athlete, Navy SEAL, or murderer, or professor of political science? I think professor of political science, probably. Um, this is great. I love this question. I can say right off the bat that it is a myth that high t that you, so like if I always tell my students this when I just look out at all my students sitting in the auditorium, if I knew every guy's testosterone level, I couldn't really predict it within the healthy normal range. It wouldn't give me any more information about who's obsessed with dominance, who's good at sports, who really, you know, has had the most sexual partners or has the highest sex drive or is the most aggressive. This is the case in humans and in non-human animals. So differences among men in testosterone are not predictive of much. You can even manipulate a man's testosterone level a lot, and you do not see changes in sex or aggression. However, if you raise it really high out of the normal male range, or you castrate him or chemically castrate him, say if, if he's getting tre treatment for prostate cancer, then you see energy decline, you see competitiveness decline, you see sexual interest decline. So out of the normal male range is what counts. Uh, and it is the huge sex difference in testosterone that explains that why men are so much more, um, have such much higher libidos and say uh, much higher taste for sexual variety, more physically aggressive. That's not because of differences within the male range. That's they have, you know, 15, 20 times more testosterone than um, women. So what I do think is it more interesting is the early T exposure, the T in utero, shaping the brain, changing the way that neurons grow and develop and die off. I think that is super important. We do not know enough about it. I, my own feeling is that individual differences in testosterone in utero do make a difference in adult behavior, but I don't know that it's the case. We don't have evidence that um, within men, we could predict much. We do know women are extremely sensitive, uh, female fetuses anyway, to um, differences in testosterone. So that's all I can say um, about that. That's a great question. Our speaker busted. Oh. Amy, no, we're good, we're back, Amy. Yes, first of all, I just want to thank you for an amazing uh, presentation. I've learned a lot. Well, thank and you. My question is along the lines of Harvey and Susan's questions, perhaps. perhaps. And one of the difficulties with applying animal studies to humans is the, the difficulty of what a human being is, because that's not clear as to, so you have, among animals, you have pairing animals like birds, you have herding animals like the deer, you have pack animals like the dogs, and I'm not sure about the primates. So I want to ask that question, whether or not there are any pairing primates for one. And then just the more general difficulty is what is a human being? Aristotle said, makes two very <laughs> stark statements. He says, a human being is a political animal, which suggests something like herding or packing. But he yeah. also says that a human being is a coupling animal. So I don't know if you've thought about the, those issues or not. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think I thought, I think about those issues a lot. Um, I talk, I have, I have a bunch, I am obsessed with birds. I love birds. I love to watch birds, take pictures of birds. I wrote about birds a bit in the book because they're so interesting because both parents are absolutely needed in many bird species, obviously, to raise their offspring. And males are intensely involved in parenting, but they're also intensely competitive 
um, for mates. And, you know, they have to come early in the spring and establish their territory before the females even get there. So the strongest males get the best territories. Those are the ones that the most fit females who come earliest in the spring will want to build their nests in. So um, the point is that testosterone does the same thing basically in male birds as it's doing in humans, it, even though we're completely different taxa, we're talking about birds and mammals, but testosterone is what it's just like the red deer in a lot of ways, in terms of the seasonal effects of testosterone, you got the coloration, you got the singing, you got the competitiveness, but then when the babies come, when the chicks come, the male testosterone must be suppressed. If you, in order for him to, cause we have nests out here in my yard. I watch the male come and go, come. It makes, it makes me get a little teary, come and go, come and go. It's mind blowing how hard he works. And I think about my own family and how hard my husband works. And it's not, he's not like working for my, me and my kid, but there is something to that, that fathers are working their asses off, you know, and it, and they work harder when they have kids and it, the male birds are doing that. If you raise his tea while he's supposed to be being a dad, he neglects his kids. He goes singing and looking for mates. It's like, it's testosterone. It does it. And, um, his kids will die. So, it's not always adaptive to have high testosterone and be out looking for mates, right? It's adaptive in many species and depending on the situation for men and humans to pay attention to their wife and kids and um, to be, go get the resources, go work to bring home the bacon or the spider or whatever the heck it is. So I think about that a lot and there are monogamous primates and I don't know, there's the gibbon, um, but really there's just very few mammals where you get the, um, male investing in the kids. There's some rodents and they're really interesting to study hormonally. Um, but in humans, we have the same thing where when males get into a serious pair bond, uh, and then when they have babies, it's what's interesting is the testosterone goes down a bit and it's the stimuli the environmental stimuli of the babies are what causes the testosterone to decline in birds and in humans. So the more that men interact with their babies, the more uh, of a decline they have. If they don't interact with their babies, that doesn't happen. And also testosterone in men can go up when they have other kinds of environmental stimuli, just like we see in birds. If you put a foreign bird, an, an intruder bird into a male's territory, his testosterone shoots up. And that enables him to be super aggressive and to be motivated. And we see the same thing in humans in um, male male competition that testosterone can rise. So it's this reciprocal interaction, testosterone interacting with the environment to do what is needed or what has been needed in our evolutionary past um, for males to reproduce. Jean. Okay. We can't hear you. Who's next? Jean, Jean, Jean. We need to, you need to unmute. Unmute. Okay, here I am. Uh, I'm just a little slow on this stuff. Um, I want to go back to a comment you made about the military. I wonder, I assume that there must be studies about male and female testosterone in among people who pursue military careers. And I wonder if you would um, comment on those studies, um, which I'm assuming exist, and then also um, uh, state whatever policy implications you think there might be, because at present we now have removed all combat limitations on women, as far as I understand it. So could you say something about those things, please? Yeah, I there are studies on um, some older studies that I know about on testosterone among military people. Um, and I don't know of any recent studies, the older studies, I don't, um, 
remember that there are any differences between people who go into the military and people who don't. And I also don't know if there are um, anything shown about testosterone differences and who achieves what rank. Maybe you're asking something like that. Um, no, but, I was just thinking about com a, a combat. So were you thinking that they should have more testosterone or? Uh, uh, well, if women don't have as much testosterone as most men do, then yeah. what are the policy implications of having women fighting alongside men in combat? I mean, yeah. you said there okay. are a lot of studies about just how uh, the military has adapted to women's relative weakness, changing the, the number of pounds they have to carry yeah. in terms of equipment and the kinds of exercises that they do. So I yeah. was just wondering no, and if that you you're a policy analyst. Yeah. So you're, you're right that, um, testosterone is what is responsible for those huge differences in strength. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would say it's not the testosterone that should matter. It's how strong is the individual. And you will almost never get a woman who has the upper body strength of a man. Like that's men are, are just, just blow women away in upper body strength. And that's what seems to be necessary for the kind of fighting maybe that would be required. So I wouldn't, I can't say, um, yeah, what the policy should be. I just personally would want to make it out of safety and not out of, um, just trying to be kind to women. Like I, um, I think this, you know, when your life is and other people's lives are at risk, you have to make the decision based on <laughs> what makes the most sense to save lives and be a good combatant. <laughs> so I'm not sure that's about the testosterone level. I would think that that's about strength, which does have to do with testosterone, but I don't have the answer. And I do, I mean, it is harder for women to kill people. Um, we have, we have more empathy. And that does seem to do with testosterone. Uh, but I would hope that we could make those decisions on an individual basis. But yeah, I, I don't have the answers. I think it's an important question, though. I would say in some way, when it comes to the defense of the country, it may be a, about the most important. I mean, compared to sports or women yes. in STEM and <laughs> right. all of those other questions, the question right. of military defense and self-preservation is fundamental. Yeah. And, and there are some places where there are women, um, women have formed groups of small militaries that do quite well, evidently. And I haven't studied them, but I want to, I, I learned about them as I was finishing the book. So that's interesting because I do think, again, when we talk about these sex differences, it's that the bar for the expression of the male behavior is low. The bar for the expression of the same behavior in females is high, but it doesn't mean that we're not capable of the same kinds of super aggressive behaviors given, you know, if your kid's life is um, in danger, you will kick the crap out of anyone and you'll risk your own life. Right. So um, I, I think that the culture and the environment do matter a huge amount, but I would say, yeah, on average, women are not as equipped to fight physically as men. And I don't know how, how you deal with that on a policy level. Well, Carol, uh, this has been wonderful. You're full of truth. You're bursting with truth. <laughs> and what's more, it's refreshing. So thank you so thank much you. for coming to us. And if, if there's others who want to uh, hang on for a bit, and if you want to uh, stay on for a bit longer, but this, sure. this, this ends our, our regular meeting. And thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And I'm happy to stay on. <laughs> <laughs>